So I think it's time we discuss the elephant in the room. Isn't it crazy that it actually applies here? We have a topic that is always there, but no one ever really talks about it. There's actually a couple of things here that I want to discuss. The woolly mammoth and permafrost. When it comes to scientists, I have this thing where I feel whenever they say they are going to do something, chances are they've done it already. We constantly hear that they are getting closer and closer to bringing this animal back into existence, but they can't bring back the woolly mammoth. They can only bring back a close replica of the original because, for one, you have to use an Asian or African elephant to be the agent for the embryo. You can't clone a mammoth from a preserved specimen because of the amount of radiation the specimen has been hit with over many years. The only way you could do that is if you have woolly mammoths still roaming around somewhere on earth. Here's the thing. Who said that the woolly mammoth wasn't the result of genetic engineering, hybridization, or replication itself? I mean, we have already entertained the idea that the ancients may have had some type of genetic engineering capabilities. Because much like dinosaurs, much like a saber-toothed tiger, this does seem like a monstrous animal compared to every other land animal we know of today, including elephants. This is a giant elephant covered in foot-long hairs with huge tusks. We don't truly know what these animals were all about. We can make a best guess based on the evidence we have available, but some things of course are still theory. And you can tell because they have to periodically revise and update their research findings. And then there are a few who probably do know the truth about these beasts. So let's take a closer look at the mammoth, another giant of the ancient world. How many of you know the origin to extinction story of woolly mammoths? So according to the fossil evidence and record, we first have the African elephant. The descendant of that elephant during the late Miocene was the Southern Mammoth. The Southern Mammoth later spread into Asia, becoming the Steppe Mammoth. The Steppe Mammoth then became the Woolly Mammoth and then spread out from Asia into Europe northeastern Siberia and North America. The North American mammoths then spread out and became the Columbian mammoths, Jefferson mammoths, and the Channel Islands pygmy mammoths. Now, in Africa you have two main species of elephant, the F and S, the forest and savanna African elephants. The southern mammoth the only real difference besides their nuclear genetic variation is that they have larger tusks and slightly larger body structure. So the story is, and there are variations to the story. After hundreds of thousands of years of existence, mammoths, not elephants, mammoths, went extinct about 10,500 years ago. Elephants survived. This extinction, they think, was due to climate change and hunting by humans. Now let me say that again. Humans hunted and killed mammoths, but not really elephants. And the climate took care of the rest, but not humans and elephants. Now, what they think happened was there was a group of mammoths between northeastern Siberia and North America. Once the sea levels changed, the water rose and caused flooding, leaving an island isolated from northeastern Siberia and North America called Wrangel Island. 
The last remaining mammoths there begin to interbreed, resulting in mass deformities, diseases, and dwarfism. They were said to go extinct due to human settlement. This is of course different than the extinction of mammoths on St. Paul Island of Alaska. Permafrost is any type of ground that has been frozen for more than two years up to hundreds of thousands of years, whether that's sedimentary rock or soil. This is found in northern latitudes and mountain peaks. Huge chunks, sometimes the permafrost extends to over a mile deep. What happens is the water that is in the soil, the cracks and crevices, the puddles, whatever water manages to end up in the pores of rocks, once it gets under zero degrees Celsius, it's frozen and can remain frozen for years. You find it in Alaska, Siberia, Canada, in the Rocky Mountains, Tibet. You also have undersea permafrost in the Arctic Ocean floor. In the southern hemisphere, the permafrost is mostly in the mountains like the New Zealand Alps and the Andes and under Antarctica, of course. So right now, the permafrost around the world is melting. Is that a problem for the Earth? No. Is that a problem for us? Yes. The Earth doesn't give a crap about gas emissions. We do. Some people, anyways. And that's only because we know about it. So if we didn't know about it, we would just survive the best way we could regardless. Just like what we are doing right now with the things that we can't control. It is amazing to think that we can completely control our environment. Almost every animal or plant I know of moves the earth. We all terraform it. Ants terraform, plants terraform with their roots and growing all over the place. Nobody gets mad at them. You have all types of animals that dig underground. Nobody gets mad at them. Cows and methane. Nobody gets mad at the cows, just the people who raise them, right? We are talking about 9 million square miles of the earth that is permafrost with over a 10% loss since the early 1900s. Stored greenhouse gases get released. Things that were frozen begin to finish up the once paused decomposition process. Microorganisms come back some very ancient and some very problematic. So now you have ancient diseases coming back. The infrastructure starts to crumble because the frozen soil and rock become mush and slush. Crevices and cracks open up just like the way potholes in the street open up after winter. Sinkholes open up, people are displaced. Over 35 million people live on permafrost land. So what's been happening is, since the permafrost has been melting, it's been uncovering some things. And so they are finding a lot more remains from mammoths, well-preserved remains, tusk and all. Some people believe that these creatures are very much alive in remote sections, of course. Siberia is pretty big. And why not? Why should they all be extinct? There are many parts of the earth that no one has seen. Maybe just a handful of people. Let's not forget that. If you believe in Admiral Richard Byrd's diary, he said he saw them up at the North Pole. Up in that massive depression of land we call the North Pole. Let me tell you all something. If cosmic and sun radiation is constantly flowing in and out from the North and South Poles all day every day since the beginning of the earth, in high doses, what does that do to the ground, the surface in that area? You know, Admiral Byrd is not the only pilot. Several pilots throughout history have said they have spotted herds of animals that look like woolly mammoths. But understand folks, if you're flying over a remote area and you spot something like that, but aren't 100% sure of what it was you had seen, in most cases, you're probably not going to fly back there and see the same thing again. So all you are left with is a story and mild description. 
some scientists are saying now that we need to bring back mammoths to save the world because the population of mammoths terraforming the Arctic regions somehow kept the environment in check. And I'm just like, they need to go on ahead with that crap. They absolutely intend on bringing these creatures back. They've been telling everyone for years. And isn't it interesting after decades that they never quite seem to do it? Of course, mammoths are not the only beings they are trying to revive out of extinction. There is something more to this animal than what they are telling us. How many of you have ever heard of the Explorers Club dinner of 1951? Let me show you something published by The Atlantic. A few weeks before the Explorers Club held its annual dinner in 1951, the organization, a society for field researchers and dedicated adventurers, received a letter with a strange request. It came from Paul Howes, a taxidermist, diorama painter, and curator at the Bruce Museum in Greenwich, Connecticut, the Explorers Club. Dear Explorers Club, Unfortunately, I will have to be away at the time of the annual dinner, but I am so anxious to have a fragment of that 250,000-year-old mastodon meet for this museum that I had planned to secretly pocket my share and exhibit here for all time instead of swallowing it. Would the club let me have my tidbit preserved for this purpose if I sent in my $9.50, although I cannot be there to get it myself on the night of the dinner? This is a crazy request, but then you know explorers. I don't see why anybody else should get my share either. So if you all say yes, I will send the check in an official bottle of preservative in which to drop this remarkable item. Then we will have something here besides models and pictures and a couple of spare teeth to brag about. There in the grand ballroom of the Roosevelt Hotel, hundreds of scientists and explorers hiking boots and pith helmets swapped out for tuxedos would dig into the prehistoric snack as they traded stories about their latest adventures and sipped drinks cooled with bits of Alaskan glacier. As a PhD candidate in paleontology at Yale and a student member of the Explorers Club, Matt Davis had heard the story of the mammoth steak. He knew it to be the first and strangest in the club's tradition of serving odd foodstuffs, a practice it continues today. More recent menus have included deep-fried tarantulas, martinis garnished with goat eyeballs, and the barbecued sex organs of bulls. He knew that tour guides at the Explorers Club headquarters in New York's Upper East Side often took visitors into the trophy room pointing out the tusk of the mammoth whose meat had been eaten in 1951. You know, when I think about elitists and scientists in the same room together, yeah, that sounds about right. They have found species of animals that were thought to be extinct before, like the colacanth fish, thought to be extinct for over 70 million years, yet they found one alive in 1938. They don't know why the mammoth went extinct. They truly do not. And they come up with some very fascinating theories. They have cut into some of these specimens. One time they cut into a specimen and then the thing bled. The fact is, they still know very little about mammoths, even with all the lab work they have done over the years. This is an animal with antifreeze blood, they say. And that explains it. We have seen certain animal species reemerge on their own after having said gone extinct. Could that be the same case with mammoths? And if they can return, reemerge due to the changing earth these days, what other great beasts are out there that may try to make a comeback? Because they found way more than just mammoths out in that melting permafrost. The freaking Explorers Club. Need I say more? There's a lot more madness to come, folks. Stay tuned. Some more interesting topics on the way. Be sure to visit woodwardentertainment.com. Check out the Woodward Entertainment Store for all your WTV merchandise. 
Make sure you hit the like button and turn on notifications. As a very small percentage has actually hit the bell and turned on YouTube notifications. Until next time, everyone, stay awake, stay aware, stay safe, and I'll talk to you all soon.